visiting with us, we would love to be able to contact you in order to hear more about how God is working in your life and to pray for you. There are two easy ways to do this. First, you can fill out a Connect card located in the seat back in front of you. Completed Connect cards can be placed in the black boxes located in the back of the room or given to the Welcome Center in exchange for a gift. Second, you can fill out this card digitally by scanning the QR code on the Connect card. If you've been attending Graceway and are thinking about membership, we want to invite you to our next pre-membership class called Graceway 101. This class will help you learn all the information you need to know to decide if you would like to become a church member. If you are interested, all you need to do is go to the website and sign up. The class lasts about an hour and a half and lunch is provided. Coming up on Sunday evening, April 7th, we will be having an all church sing service. This service will include many solo opportunities. If you would like to sign up to sing a special, please just go to the church website. Hey, Graceway guys, make sure you drop by the church website to sign up for our men's conference, April 26th through the 27th. The cost is 25 per person and will feature evangelist Kent York, giveaways, great fellowship, and lots of delicious food. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Please silence your cell phones as our worship service is about to begin. Morning and welcome to Easter at Graceway. We are thrilled that you're here to worship the risen Savior with us. The early church had a way of greeting one another, and I want us to practice it together. If one believer would say to another, He is risen, they would answer back, He is risen indeed. You want to practice that? Because uh, there will be a test later in the service. I want you to be ready. So let's try that one time. He is risen. risen Very good. Boy, there's good energy, excitement. We're happy to be here. It's Easter. We all look a little fancier. Uh, We just cleaned up a little extra. Even I I wore this tie today. Um, Stephen McMurphy gave me this tie. The bald guitar player, if you don't know. He said, uh, you know, this tie was given to me. I don't want it. Do you want it? Uh, That made me, well, I'll take anything that's free. So I hung it in my closet and I said, I don't know about that. I don't think I'll ever wear, I thought, Easter. I'll just, I'll have like a little Easter egg around my neck. So there you go. That's my, that's my Easter outfit. My hand-me-down Easter tie. Thank you, Stephen. (laughs) Glad that you're here. We've got a great service planned, and uh, most importantly, uh, we are going to worship Jesus, the risen one, together. I would like to say as our service begins, welcome and especially welcome to you if you are with us for the very first time. We love meeting and making new friends at Graceway. We hope you feel welcome. Uh, The other half of the congregation uh, will be with us in a few moments. They're still out in the gym having donuts, Uh, but they'll they'll find us here in just a minute, and uh, we're we're glad that you made it in. And uh, I would just also say this. If you are new, we would love to know you. An easy way to introduce yourself, if you'd like to, is just to fill out one of those connect cards in the seat back in front of you. Drop that in an offering box or out in the lobby at the Welcome Center. Just let us know you were here with us today. We'd love to make your acquaintance. And with that, we have a little tradition here, a way that we like to greet one another. We like to say, let's all stand. And while the musicians get ready to lead us in worship, you tell somebody nearby, I'm glad to see you in church this morning. Happy Easter. Church, let's all sing together. How great the chasm that lay between us, 
How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living Down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to out of silence, out of silence. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no pain on me. Jesus, your He lives forever. 
Christ Jesus has risen from the grave, and we are here to worship the risen Savior. We have worshiped him through prayer. We have worshiped him through singing of praises. And one other way that we need to worship him is through the act of giving. We worship through giving. And we let God's word instruct us on how we ought to give. And so this morning, we are reminded of John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life that tells us a lot on how we give we give sacrificially we give because God gave Christ Jesus to us and so when we're giving we're doing so because we want to be like God but we need God's help that motive that desire that can't come from within. That has to come from outside of us. It has to be a work that the Father does in us through his spirit. So we need to pray. We need to pray that God would do that work yet again, because without his help, it is impossible. We're reminded that the way in which we give is in the black boxes located in the back of the room as we're leaving worship today. A lot of people give online. Some people give by mail. You know, the mechanism that we use to give, that's not what's significant. But the heart behind giving, that's everything. So we need God Almighty to do a work in our hearts this morning. So if I could invite you to pray with me that we would invite the Father to do just that. Father, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you for sending your son Christ Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. We didn't deserve it but because of your grace and your mercy you gave him. Father, as we're considering what worship would look like this morning, help us to give so that we can be like you. Help us to give so that we can worship you, Lord. God, we want to make much of you. There's no other name in all of heaven and earth that we can proclaim but you. God, we need you. We have you. We thank you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Please listen as the praise team sings for us.
delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins he is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth visible 
and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth, in heaven, or under the earth, making peace by the blood of his cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee would bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. thankful. Let's stand together. Let's sing this together. Hallelujah. Every voice will proclaim. Let's sing.
He'll fix my eyes on Jesus Christ. I'll say that it is well. this morning thanking you that we are overcomers because of what Jesus Christ has done for us he has won the battle over sin over death over the grave we're so thankful in Jesus name amen amen he is risen he is risen indeed praise the Lord you know the resurrection of Jesus Christ the reason we celebrate Easter because Jesus Christ conquered death by his resurrection. We have eternal life in him. I want to talk to you this morning about Jesus' resurrection from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Just as the heart pumps life-giving blood to every part of the body, so the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives life 
to every other area of gospel truth. The resurrection is the pivot on which all of Christianity turns and without which no other Bible truth would very much matter. You see, without the resurrection, Christianity would be no much more than wishful thinking taking its place alongside other human philosophy and religious speculation. The resurrection of Jesus Christ makes all the difference. The resurrection was the focal point of every other truth that Jesus Christ taught. Mark 8, 31, Jesus taught his disciples that, quote, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected and be killed and after three days rise again. It was Jesus Christ who on another occasion said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies, John eleven twenty eight. 28. In fact, the first two sermons preached after Pentecost focused on the resurrection of Jesus Christ because of that truth that Jesus had risen from the dead and was alive, the disciples of Jesus reduced to heartbroken followers of a crucified Savior were turned into the courageous eyewitnesses and martyrs who, in just a few years, spread the gospel across the Roman Empire and beyond. What made the difference? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, belief in the resurrection, the truth that this life is only a prelude, a preview of the life to come for those who know Jesus Christ as Savior, that truth cannot be obliterated by ridicule, prison, torture, or even death. No fear, no dread in this life can quench the hope and the joy of the assured life to come. In fact, the Bible teaches plainly that without the resurrection, apart from the resurrection, if there was no resurrection, then salvation cannot be received. How do I know? Because Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. It's not possible, therefore, to be a Christian and not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You, you may call yourself a Christian. You, you may think of yourself as a Christian, but the Bible is abundantly clear. If we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most miserable. Only through faith in Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Yes, Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. Yes, Jesus was buried in a borrowed tomb, but it all hinges upon his glorious resurrection and his victory over sin, death, hell, and the grave. I have two goals for this Easter sermon. I had three goals in the first service. The first one was to get it done fast so we could get them out and get you in. I don't have that problem this time. You are at my mercy. So we don't have that to worry about. But I still have two other goals for this Easter sermon. Here's the first. It's my prayer that believers in Jesus Christ and his resurrection, that, that we would be affirmed and strengthened in our faith as Christ followers who walk in a world filled with 
unbelievers and scoffers and mockers of Jesus and his resurrection. It's my prayer that we would be affirmed and even emboldened in our faith. But secondly, it's my prayer that someone hearing my voice and more importantly the words of Holy Scripture this morning would be moved to faith in Jesus Christ, that they would be saved today. And I intend to do that by sharing with you from the Word of God three compelling evidences, three testimonies concerning the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the opening verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The three evidences are the scriptures themselves. Secondly, credible witnesses. And thirdly, the personal experience of a changed life. Those are the three. The evidence of scripture itself, the evidence of credible eyewitnesses, and thirdly, the evidence and the testimony of a changed life. Listen as I read for you the opening verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Our text for the sermon begins in verse 4, but I, I want to start with verse 1. The apostle writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit gives us these words. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved if you hold fast to that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen by Cephas then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present day, though some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles. I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Don't you love those words of Paul? Because of Jesus, I am what I am, not what I was. The testimony of Scripture, the testimony of witnesses, the testimony of a life radically changed. Let's pray and look at the Scripture together. Father, we're gathered this morning to celebrate the resurrection of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, left heaven and came to this earth on a mission to go to the cross where he laid down his life and shed his blood, the sacrifice for my sin, for our sin. And I pray this morning, as we think about the death of Jesus, the burial of Jesus, and certainly the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that our hearts would be moved to greater faith and that someone would trust Jesus today, calling upon him for their salvation. And I pray it in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. 
Proof number one, the proof of Scripture. The first evidence for Christ's resurrection is the Old Testament, the Scriptures of Judaism and the early church. That's what Paul's talking about when he says twice in our text, according to the Scripture. According to the Scripture. He's talking about the Old Testament Scripture, the New Testament, just being in the process of being written. We know the New Testament chronicles the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We know from Matthew to Revelation, the New Testament tells us much about the resurrection of Christ, but many people are surprised to know that the Old Testament talks about and clearly predicted the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, his death, burial, and resurrection. Perhaps I could share with you just a couple of examples of that. After his resurrection, Jesus met two men, two men on the road to Emmaus who didn't know that Jesus had risen from the dead. Oh, they knew about the crucifixion of Christ, and their hearts were sad. They didn't know that it was the risen Jesus walking with them and talking with them as they were traveling home from Jerusalem. And Jesus said to those two men, O oh, foolish men and slow of heart, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. It was necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and enter into his glory. And then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, the Old Testament scripture, Jesus explained to them all things concerning himself in all the scripture. The Old Testament tells the story of Jesus Christ. Why, when the unbelieving Jews of Jesus' day asked for a miraculous sign of his Messiahship, Jesus quoted Scripture again. He said, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign shall be given to it but this sign, the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and nights in the belly of the fish, so shall the Son of Man be three days and nights in the heart of the earth. Jonah, a picture of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Even post-resurrection Christianity, Peter preaching his great Pentecost sermon, quoted from the Old Testament scripture, Psalm 16, when he said, David, in his prophecy of Christ, looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay, Acts 2, 25 through 31. The apostle Paul, when witnessing, when preaching before King Agrippa, he said this, Agrippa, having obtained help from God, I stand this day testifying to both small and great, stating nothing other than what the prophets and Moses have said was going to take place, that the Christ would suffer, and by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would first proclaim light, to the Jews and also to the Gentiles, Acts 26, 22, and 23. When Jesus told others of his own resurrection, he pointed them to the Old Testament scriptures. When Peter and Paul and the other apostles would preach and proclaim the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they pointed to the witness of the Word of God. They referred to such Old Testament passages as 
Genesis 22, 8, Psalm 16, 8 through 11, Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, Hosea 6, 2, over and over and over again, whether directly or indirectly, whether literally or in figure of speech, the Old Testament foretold the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why the people of Jesus' day, those who believed the scriptures, they shouldn't have been surprised, confused, or perplexed that Messiah was ordained to die, to be buried, and then to rise from the dead. Twice in our text, Paul repeats the phrase, according to to the scripture to emphasize that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was no new teaching, it was no new thing, it was no unexpected event, but rather predicted by the prophets centuries before it occurred. Now you say, Pastor, that's fine for people who believe the Bible. People like me. People like you who believe the Bible is the word of God. You see that the the scripture is a powerful evidence. The scripture is a powerful witness. But what about those who aren't convinced the Bible is authoritative in what it teaches? Well, I would to those people offer and call my next witness. You know, throughout human history, The testimony of responsible, credible, and honest eyewitnesses has been considered one of the most reliable forms of evidence in any court of law. The proof of witnesses. Whether you have been in court as a defendant, certainly not any of us, whether, whether you were there as a witness, or, or maybe you just watch a lot of TV and you've seen some courtroom drama, you kind of know how that works. The witness is called to the witness stand, and they are sworn to give honest and reliable testimony concerning what they saw, what they heard, what they know to be fact. Perhaps you've seen something like this. A witness might say, well, I heard Larry say that Mary told him that George thinks, and the judge would say, that is hearsay testimony. I need you, Mr. Witness, to stick to what you heard, what you saw, what you know to be true. Fact. The second evidence for the resurrection of Christ is in the form of credible eyewitnesses who told what they saw and what they heard. In fact, did you know that that the principle of, of witness testimony is even found in the Word of God where the Bible teaches us in both the Old and New Testament that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word will be established. Why we have many more witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ than just two or three and in fact that beginning in verse 5 Paul begins to call the roll, and he starts with witness number one, verse five, a man named Cephas, you know him better, by the name that Jesus gave him, Peter. Peter the Apostle. We're not told why Jesus appeared to Peter first or separately, or or even exactly where and when that meeting took place. But he appeared to Simon Peter first. Possibly, and I believe this is the reason why, Peter's 
great remorse and grief and shame over having denied his Lord. Because of his role as a leader among leaders, as a leader among the apostles and in the primitive church, it was to Peter first Jesus went emphasizing the grace of our Lord. Peter had forsaken Jesus, but Jesus hadn't forsaken Peter. Don't you love that? Christ did not appear to Peter because Peter deserved to see Jesus most but perhaps because Peter needed to see him most. After that shameful and unfortunate night in which Peter denied even knowing Jesus three times, Jesus found Peter and appeared to him. The text says that he also appeared to the twelve, verse five. Now we know Judas is gone, so there are 11 when Jesus rises from the dead, but they are still known, their, their title, people still call them the 12. Jesus' appearance to the 12, as mentioned, transformed them from a, a fearful group that were found hiding behind locked doors on Easter night. John 20, Luke 24. And why were they hiding? Why were they in fear? The Bible tells us they were terrified of the angry mobs of the Jews who called for the crucifixion of Jesus and even the Roman officials who nailed their Lord to a cross. They'll be coming for us next. That's what they believed. And they were frightened. Those men whom the Lord used to establish his church on earth, they saw Jesus in his resurrected body, Acts 1.22. These were capable, honest, reliable witnesses to the most important event of human history. And in fact, nearly every one of the apostles died a horrific, torturous death for preaching and defending the resurrection of Christ. I don't want you to miss the importance of their testimony. I don't want you to miss the proof of these eyewitnesses. They each suffered a horrific, torturous death because they would not recant the truth of Jesus' resurrection. Matthew was killed by a sword. John was boiled in oil. James, the half-brother of Jesus, was thrown from the southeast pinnacle of the temple over 100 feet high. Nathaniel was martyred by being flayed to death by a whip. Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross in Greece. After being whipped severely, they tied his body to the cross to prolong his agony. His followers reported that while being led to the cross, he saluted it with these words, I have long desired and expected this happy hour. The cross has been consecrated by the body of Christ hanging upon it, and he continued to preach to his tormentors for two days until he died. Thomas was stabbed to death with a spear in India. Matthias was stoned and beheaded. Paul was tortured and beheaded by Emperor Nero in 67 AD. I could go on and on and on, but here's what all of these witnesses have in common. They were each given the opportunity to escape death if they would merely admit that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was untrue. Listen, we can understand people telling a lie. <laughs> 
We can understand people making up stories. But when you're being threatened with fire, with spear, with sword, with any manner of undescribable torture and death, and all you need to say to escape is, I was just kidding. We made it all up. We stole Jesus' body. It's a hoax. Come and I'll show you where the body is. But not one single witness recanted in the face of unspeakable death. That's powerful testimony for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that Jesus, verse 6, was seen by over 500 brethren at once. Big crowd. Again, the scripture's not clear. We don't know exactly where or when that, that could have been at the ascension of Jesus Christ. But, but Paul said, verse 6, it wasn't just Peter. It wasn't just the 12. On one occasion, 500 people saw him at the same time. In fact, the greater part of them remain to the present, at the time of Paul's writing of 1 Corinthians, he said, go ask them. Most of them are still alive and would love to tell you what they saw and heard. In fact, if, if the quality of witness testimony is seen in the 12 who refuse to recant even when facing death, the quantity of witnesses is seen in these 500 who all at the same place and the same time saw Jesus alive after his resurrection. But we're not done. Paul keeps going. He says in verse 7, after that, he was seen by James. Now, there were several Jameses in the followers of Jesus. In fact, two Disciples were named James. I, I, we're not told, but I believe, I'll tell you my opinion. If I could just tell you what I think, I think this is James, the half brother of our Lord. Peter's already been singled out as the leader of the apostles. The apostles have already seen Jesus as a group. Now he turns his attention to James. The half-brother. Why do I call him the half-brother of our Lord? Because there were brothers and sisters born to Joseph and Mary after the birth of Christ. The New Testament's clear on that. The New Testament and the Gospels are also clear that Jesus' own brothers and sisters did not believe in him. In fact, that they went so far on at least one occasion to imply that Jesus might be insane because he talked so much about being the Messiah and the Son of God. James was not a believer until he saw the resurrected Christ. He was saved and went on to be a leader in the Jerusalem church and the author of the epistle that bears his name. <laughs> Originally a skeptic, not believing, but changed by a face-to-face -face encounter with the resurrected Christ. Over a period of 40 days, Acts 1-3, between his resurrection and his ascension, Jesus appeared Peter, to all the apostles, to a large group of witnesses, and to James. And their testimony is overwhelming evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in fact, it would not be an exaggeration to say that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is one of the best witnessed, one of the best authenticated, and one of the most sure events of all human history. And then, number three, the proof of experience. And I mean by that, 
the proof of a life changed. Paul said, I want you to think about the scripture, the unified message of the Bible, Old and New Testament, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. I want you to think about the testimony of all of these witnesses. It's powerful evidence. But I want you to think thirdly about the proof of experience. Paul said, I'm talking about me. He said, last of all, verse 8, he was seen by me. And then Paul begins to say some odd things about himself. He said, I, I, I'm, I'm like one born out of due time. I wasn't one of the original 12. I wasn't there for the feeding of the 5,000. I, I wasn't part of that group. Jesus appeared to me later. And in fact, verse 9, Paul said, I'm the least of the apostles. I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle. On another occasion, Paul called himself the king of sinners. You thought that was you. Unless you've murdered Christians because you hate Jesus so much, you got nothing on Paul in the sin department. So I'm not even worthy, but Jesus appeared to me. The amazing thing, Paul wasn't even saved. He wasn't a believer when Jesus appeared to him in a face-to-face -face encounter on the road to Damascus, Acts chapter 9. Paul was a violent, hateful unbeliever who spent his days chasing down and persecuting Christians. He hated Jesus so much, a Jesus he didn't even believe in. Kind of like the atheist you know that spends an awful lot of time and energy hating a God he doesn't even claim to believe in. It was Paul. Jesus he didn't even believe in. Hated Christ so much he dedicated and devoted himself to the persecution and arrest and, yes, even murder of Christians and the destruction of their churches. What could change a Jesus hater into a preacher of the gospel? What could change a man dedicated to the destruction of Christians into a follower of Jesus Christ. Well, the truth and power of the resurrected Christ did that. An encounter with the risen Savior did that. In fact, Jesus made several profound changes in Paul. First was the deep recognition of sin. You know, Paul was a pretty self-righteous guy. If you don't know what that means, Paul thought that he was so good that he didn't need to have any sin forgiven. Now, if that confuses you, wait a minute. Now, you just said he killed Christians, but you understand Paul thought he was defending Orthodox Judaism. Paul thought he was defending God himself. Paul thought he was defending the true way against this false Messiah, Jesus. That's what he thought. In his zeal, he thought he was defending God. But he recognized that he was far from being godly. That he himself was in fact the enemy of God and the persecutor of Christ's church. Paul experienced a profound revolution of character. He was changed by Jesus from a persecutor of the church to become the church's greatest defender. His life was transformed from one characterized by self-righteous hatred to self-giving love. He was changed from oppressor to servant. 
from imprisoner to deliverer, from judge to friend, and from taker of life to giver of life. And thirdly, Paul experienced a dramatic redirection of energy. In other words, his life got a new purpose. He got a new mission. Just as he had zealously opposed God's redeemed, he now served them. And the testimony of a changed heart, the testimony of a changed life in someone who has been saved by faith in Jesus Christ is one of the most powerful evidences of all. Scripture Powerful evidence. Eyewitnesses willing to die for their testimony. Powerful witness. A radical Christ hater transformed into the greatest Christian missionary this world has ever known. That's powerful evidence. The witnesses have been heard the evidence has been rendered. The scriptures, both Old and New Testament, declare that Jesus has risen from the dead. Impeccable, courageous eyewitnesses gave testimony upon threat of death and yet proclaimed Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. That's powerful. Powerful proof. And this morning, you are surrounded in this room. You are surrounded by people whose lives have been forever changed, inexplicably altered. Not what we once were, but through salvation in Christ, the risen Savior. Lives that are forever changed. Powerful, powerful evidence that Jesus has risen from the dead. And that brings, that brings us to a very important question. Do you know the risen Savior as your Savior? Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Savior, have you come to a place in your life where you believed that Jesus Christ is who the Bible says that he is, the Son of God who left heaven and came to this earth on a mission to the cross where he shed his blood and laid down his life, the sacrifice, the payment for our sin guilt. Did you know that Jesus died to pay the price for your sin? He was buried and he rose from the dead victorious. And the good news, the gospel news, is that whoever believes in Jesus, his sacrifice on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, you can be forgiven. You can be a child of God. You can be saved. You can have a forever home in heaven if you will trust in what Jesus Christ has done for you and call upon him. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I would love to pray with you and for you. But just before I pray, could I challenge you in the quietness of this moment? How is it with you? Has there been a time? Can you think of a place, a moment, where you said yes to Jesus Christ? Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. Like the Bible says you are. I believe you went to the cross in a body of flesh. Like the Bible says that you did. I believe you did it for me.
to pay for my sin in order that I might be forgiven. I believe, Jesus, that you rose from the grave victorious. I believe in Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus, I'm asking you to forgive me and to save me. I'm putting my faith and trust in you and your work on the cross and your resurrection. Friend, you can do that right now in your seat with your head bowed and your eye closed. You can talk to the Lord just as easily as I'm talking to you. And you can pray that prayer, Jesus, I believe in you. I'm trusting in you. I'm asking you, Lord, forgive me of my sin and save me by the power of your sacrifice on the cross and your resurrection from the dead. Have you done that? Today's a great day. Easter Sunday is a great day to be saved. We want to help you with that. When we sing our closing song in just a moment, you're going to see Graceway counselors right here at the front. They're here to help you. You're going to see Graceway pastors out in the lobby. We're ready to pray with you. Don't leave this place without making sure that heaven is your home and your faith is in Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for giving us opportunity this morning to proclaim the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We believe and trust in Jesus for our salvation. And I pray this morning for someone that has not yet been saved, that they would call on Jesus before it's eternally too late. Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one, no one gets to God the Father. No one gets to heaven except through Him. Lord, call someone, several someones, to faith in Jesus today, I pray. In His name, amen. Praise God. Let's stand together. Let's sing this. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my Jesus Christ, my living hope, God, you are my living hope. Thank you for being here this morning. If you have a spiritual need, need someone to pray with you, there are counselors down front here, pastors in the lobby. God bless you. You are dismissed. There are donors.